Shine on me, oh, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Shine on me, oh, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes, and it is my great privilege to serve as the minister of this congregation, along with the members, friends, children, and youth, people of all ages and at all stages of life. We are an intentional community gathered around our shared promise to support each other's spiritual journeys. This is a house of love. This is a house of compassion. This is a house of justice. We do our part to help heal the world. And as we come together for worship, we are mindful of the many people who have traveled here before us. We recognize and honor the Peoria people who created their lives on these lands long before we were here. This congregation is sustained by the care and talent and generous gifts of its members and friends. If you'd like to make a financial gift, see the link in the chat or and the slide at the end of the service. And while we are gathering online for the sake of each other's health and safety, we very much welcome visitors and guests. If you are new to this congregation, I invite you to help us get to know you. At the end of the service will be the link uh, for our coffee hour at Zoom. All are invited to the conversation. And also, if you'd like to get to know more about the congregation, please contact us through the website. As we close this month's theme of beloved community, I want to offer that the hymns for this service uh, include a couple of new favorites and one that is loved by many in Unitarian Universalism. Our opening hymn is Morning Has Come by the Reverend Jason Shelton. And our closing hymn is Blue Boat Home from Unitarian Universalist musician Peter Mayer. I want to thank Paul Thompson and the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Palouse in Moscow, Idaho, for their productions of these hymns. And finally, I want to thank the Unitarian Universalist Association and Melanie DeMore for the hymn, Shine On Me. And I'll offer a special notice for, uh, for worship today. If you haven't already heard, we have a big celebration coming up now in three weeks. Uh, on March 21st at 3 p.m. Central, we'll be celebrating my installation with this congregation. It is a very special event, a notable moment. And if you'd like to know more about this, I encourage you to contact us at the church. And please, uh, members and friends, I invite you to keep a lookout for your emails, for more messaging and more announcements for all the ways to be part of this great event. I hope to see you there. And now, let us enter into worship.
Our opening words today come from Starhawk. She is an author, activist, and permaculture designer and teacher, and a prominent voice in modern earth-based spirituality and ecofeminism. Her piece is called Community Means Strength. We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned. We can only catch glimpses of from time to time, community. Somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throat. Somewhere a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter, a circle of healing, a circle of friends, someplace we can be free. Light, little flame, light and tender, kindling of our souls, of warmth and love and community. From a little spark, may a fire of passion spread from heart to heart and light the way, sweet spirit, light the way. Good morning. Today I'd like to read you a simple story that shows how we all often see things differently and how indeed the same thing can be different things to different people at different times. I think that it's also a good way to show how we, as you use, can all see our faith differently but still be connected by the common principles and identity of UUism. It is called, It Looked Like Spilt Milk by Charles G. Shaw. Sometimes it looked like spilt milk, but it wasn't spilt milk. Sometimes it looked like a rabbit, but it wasn't a rabbit. Sometimes it looked like a bird, but it wasn't a bird. And sometimes it looked like a tree, but it wasn't a tree. Sometimes it looked like an ice cream cone, but it wasn't an ice cream cone. Sometimes it looked like a flower, but it wasn't a flower. Sometimes it looked like a pig, but it wasn't a pig. Sometimes it looked like a birthday cake, but it wasn't a birthday cake. Sometimes it looked like an angel, but it wasn't an angel. Sometimes it looked like spilt milk, but it wasn't spilt milk. It was just a cloud in the sky. And yet, I would suggest that the cloud might also have been all of those other things to the people who saw it. We can all see things differently at different points in our lives. And we all change our perspectives as we grow. Luckily, as those ideas and visions change for us as individuals, they can still take form within the larger faith of UUism. And we can all help each other to face the cloudy skies together. So be it. We begin our shared joys and sorrows with an invitation from the Reverends Wendy Bartell and Lynn Gardner. From our separate joys and struggles, we come here to find the peace of balance, to find the blessing of restlessness all are welcome. All are welcome to follow, to lead, to teach, to learn, to join the dance, to catch our breath. All are welcome to give generously, 
receive gratefully. All are welcome. If we are steady and composed, if we feel completely lost, if we don't know what we're feeling, this time, in this moment in our worship, is a place for us. Here we matter. Here we are loved. If you are steady and poised, if you feel completely lost, if you don't know what you feel. This is our time in our community, in our shared worship. This is a place for us. We matter and we are loved. I offer the joys and sorrows of the congregation and thank you to Shar Ricky for gathering us, for gathering them uh, for this service. I want to begin with a, a note of thanks. I want to thank and acknowledge how Dixie Rogers has been doing such a great job in being one of the office assistants in our church. And, and we offer our love to Dixie as she leaves her employment with us. We wish her all the best as she begins the next chapter of her life. And now, I turn to the deaths among us. We send our heartfelt sympathy to Ev Maloney as she mourns the loss of two nephews. Jim Maloney, age 79 from Eureka, Illinois, passed on February 18th. Wallace Huber, age 84 from Normal, Illinois, passed on February 23rd. We offer our condolences to Ev and her entire family as they grieve the loss of these two beloved people. We also have a notable moment in our larger world, that larger world that isn't actually far from us. This past week, our nation marked the milestone of having more than 500,000 deaths from COVID-19. So much has been lost, truly. There's so much that had been, that is no more, and there is so much that will no longer be. All of this cost and loss is beyond measure, practically beyond words. So let's take this moment together. We share a moment of quiet. We keep this notable moment, this notable uh, measure of death in our hearts as best we can, at the pace that we can. Let us also, in this shared moment of quiet, offer and recognize all of the sorrows, all of the milestones, all of the names, and also all of the joys everything that is around us and within us and among us. We take this moment for all that is our life as well. I invite you to pause with me and breathe. Amen. We have a second story for the service today. Uh, my colleague Misha Sanders uh, is a Unitarian Universalist minister who serves with the Northwest Unitarian Universalist Church near Atlanta, Georgia. And this account is from her youth, uh, where she was raised in the Pentecostal tradition. And at the very heart of what she learned, I will offer is that the message of God is love. I want to thank her for her permission to share this story in worship. So I invite you to hear and watch Red Bubble Letters.
I'm Misha Sanders, and this Braver, Wiser reflection is called Red Bubble Letters. My sister had just taught me how to make bubble letters, which I thought would surely impress all my friends. So before all the other children arrived, I drew and meticulously colored in big wobbly red letters, God is love, on the green chalkboard in my kindergarten Sunday school classroom. Not long into class, after all the children had arrived and pretty much ignored my artistry, one of my all-time favorite teachers picked up an eraser and began to swipe over the dusty old board, much to my dismay. But I was even more dismayed that my artistic creation did not seem to be fading, despite her vigorous attempt. Mysterious. Miraculous, perhaps. Turns out, that red chalk that was, in my defense, on the chalk tray was actually a stumpy little red crayon. The tears started, as I recall, right about the time friends began whispering that I was definitely in big trouble. I was as mortified as a six-year-old can get. I was mortified, that is, only until that beautiful, wise Sunday school teacher scooped me into her arms, and in a clear moment of amazing grace, I heard her deep alto laugh in my ear, and she said, Oh, no, no one is in trouble. Don't you see, dear children, this is just perfect. What can erase God's love? Nothing. She ended the warm hug with a squeeze and then gleefully picked up a piece of white chalk and began quickly writing around my unintentionally semi-permanent crayon art all of the things that we could think to yell out that might make us feel unlovable in the eyes of God. Lying, cheating in school, cussing, hitting your brother, cutting in line for the slide, chewing gum in church. It was a lot for kids, those conservative religious rules in the 70s. But then with dramatic flourish, she again picked up the dusty eraser and wiped it all away, leaving only God is love. God is love in big wobbly red bubble letters. It is my only memory of a lesson from kindergarten Sunday school class. And maybe it's the only one that counts. Here's a prayer. Spirit of love, when we try hard but make a mess anyway, because we are all only precious children after all, may we remember to laugh, hold each other close, and marvel at the truth that remains, which in the end is only love. Shine on me, oh, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me, oh, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Lift me up, oh, lift me up. Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Yes, lift me up. Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Oh, hold, hold me close. Yes, hold me close. Let the light. From the light, from the lighthouse, hold me close. Yes, hold me close. So hold me close. Let the light from the lighthouse, please, hold me close. So shine, shine on me, 
shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light, Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Oh, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine. For the sermon, I begin with a message from William Ellery Channing and his piece, The Great End. He says, The great end in religious instruction is not to stamp our minds upon the young, but to stir up their own, not to make them see with our eyes, but to look inquiringly and steadily with their own, not to give them a definite amount of knowledge, but to inspire a fervent love of truth, not to form an outward regularity, but to touch inward springs. Channing is one of the great elders in the history of Unitarianism. In 1819, he defined Unitarianism uh, in the sermon at the ordination of Jared Sparks in Baltimore. Channing transformed what had been a pejorative, a put-down, the Unitarians, because the primary theology in our country at the time was Trinitarian. Uh, he had transformed uh, that, that Unitarian with a little u that was a, a negative aspect into a positive declaration of belief and faith. In Unitarianism, the idea that all is one, that there is one God, to use the 18th century and 19th century language, that there is one God, one whole, integrated uh, spirit around us and among us. Now, his message about the great end in religious instruction uh, is one of the foundations in my religious education experience as an adult and also as a child growing up in the congregation uh, that I was part of in Massachusetts. So in that spirit of that uh, touching inward springs of opening the mind, I had that uh, lived experience in many ways in my Sunday school. Uh, like the story that we had earlier, it looked like spilled milk where one wondered about all of these different shapes and the nature of the substance that created them. I had so many ways to choose and understand and help make meaning of the world. I had so many avenues to learn about beliefs and practices and perspectives, all within the Sunday school. And I also had a foundation of deep trust and care that would allow me to spring forth, as Channing would be encouraging all of us to do. The great end is, as a reading and as a phrase, always helps me consider the meaning of faith development, what we do in our education programs, to be sure, but also the experience of being in a congregation for people of all ages. How do we create the beloved community right here and right now on earth. So today, I take a deeper dive into the meaning of faith development in our congregations and in Unitarian Universalism. Uh, I love how Channing encourages us to set our children and ourselves free. In his time, this was a profound statement in the face of orthodoxy and the, the primary understanding that children should be imprinted with what their elders thought they should know. But in this time and in this space, uh, there is much more to taking care of faith development than 
the simple message of flinging wide the windows of our souls. Well, that's a pretty good one, too. We need to establish methods and places that encourage us uh, to be all uh, our spiritual beings can be and to do this work in beloved community. All of us need all of us to make it, as my colleague Teresa Soto says. And we are bound within a network of mutuality, as Dr. King reminds us. And so we provide that that holding place, that community, in the context of faith development. So let me share the kind of frame that offers that kind of space to be one of religious freedom and exploration, and also well-grounded in our religious relationships. So the, the one I want to talk to you about in particular is what I learned as the big three. Um, it's a combination of work from Christian religious educator, Maria Harris, uh, adapted by Connie Goodbread, one of our leaders in Unitarian Universalism in the Southern region. Um, and they say, first, there's three parts, faith development is all we do, Unitarian Universalism is all we teach, the congregation is the curriculum. I'll say again. Faith development, the first is faith development is all we do. The second is Unitarian Universalism is all we teach. And the third, the congregation is the curriculum. So let me say a little bit about each of those. So faith development is all we do. Faith development is learning practices, learning about emotional intelligence, self differentiation, and also how do we engage with our existential questions about purpose and meaning. Faith development is that entire human experience. It's very much a human development, uh, if you will. And how do we cultivate that, recognizing that we have deep questions about life and death and meaning and our place in the universe? Faith development is about the expression of values, how would people come together for shared purpose and being mindful of the previous generations as well as those who will follow. So, Unitarian Universalism is all we teach. This might be a new idea, but hang in there with me. The reason this congregation and this building and everything that goes with it is here comes from the fact that this particular religious community is connected with a particular faith, universalism, and now Unitarian Universalism. Everything we bring into the congregation, program, worship, education, service, fellowship, is an expression of what is important to this body and is an expression of this particular tradition. We're not proclaiming to be any other particular tradition, uh, any other faith or no faith at all. Uh, it's important to be clear and intentional and know the reasons why we might include Buddhist meditation, drumming from different traditions, uh, and celebrate Christmas and Easter. All of those are present and possible. And we also need to understand why we would bring them into our Unitarian Universalist congregation. And how is that an expression of our practices and what we hope to accomplish as individuals and as a community. So Unitarian Universalism is all we teach. And the congregation is the curriculum. Um, so all that we offer, all that we do, all of our behaviors, policies, public witness, how we do coffee hour, our expressions of our values and our relationships and our expectations of one another and of ourselves. The children are watching, in case you didn't know, but so are the adults, the visitors, everyone who hears about this community. What we do and what we don't do, all of it is information. 
The great news is that we shape a lot of that information. And the great news also is the curriculum is that practice of understanding what we are shaping and why. The congregation is the curriculum. I want to take a moment, uh, pause for a moment, and offer just a few thoughts about faith, the word faith and the understanding of it. Because I know that some people struggle with that word and so much of the negative associations that it has, uh, that they're the association that it's a way to control people, convince people that something is there when it really isn't. Um, uh, that faith would imply there is no room for doubt, that there's an expectation of unquestioning trust. That's not the kind of faith that I'm talking about here. I think one of my favorite definitions of faith is the hope in things unseen. Uh, or as my colleague Lauren Wyeth says, faith is the awareness that we have that awareness that we are part of something much larger uh, than ourselves, but we are also deeply embedded in our existence as well. And then how do we know what, how to act in this moment, in the context of all that is? Daniel Cantor, uh, minister at uh, First Unitarian Church in Dallas, says that faith is, their components of it include belief, and trust, and loyalty, and worldview. These are not statements about ultimacy, about what is larger than us, uh, but faith is the experience of it. Sharon Salzberg, who is an American Buddhist writer and speaker, talks about faith as a trust, as confidence in change, that there's always something evolving, always something moving. And at the same time, that sense of faith and location, cosmic location, can offer groundedness and presence and motivation to get out into the world, to get us moving in the moment. Faith is about a deep relationship with existence. It's not trusting statements about someone or something or God, if you will, but it is the experience of trust. George Marshall, in his book, Challenge of the Liberal Faith, talks about how to live religiously, how to live in trust, in essence, is a prophetic risk. It is a brave act to have faith. It means to live. It means to live as though there are values in life and that we will create through experiences, the arena for expressing those values. Let me say again from George Marshall. Faith means to live as though there are values in life, a liberal faith, and that we will create through experience the arena for expressing those values. Faith development is often tied to a personal particular sense of religion. Uh, in this context, it's the experience of the Unitarian Universalism being what we teach. But faith development is also, as I said, mentioned earlier, a human experience, how we develop and grow as individuals. James Fowler's theory of faith development talks about how we relate to the universe and make meaning. He explores how we move from a basic relationship, um, the very beginnings of our human encounter with the world and the, the foundations of what we can trust, what we can count on, how we feel safe, to learning about the wider world, to then questioning the world, breaking it down, reshaping it with our mind, body, and spirit, and then learning how to do so again and again. And that's the arc of our human lives. Faith development is learning practices, emotional intelligence, self-differentiation, and engaging in existential questions about purpose and meaning. 
and doing so in community with each other and for each other, where we will fight and forgive and grieve and celebrate and so much more. And we do so in the context of a congregation and serving a larger purpose, a part of healing the world, even as we as human beings break it up and each other again and again. I, have a, I like the story from Misha, Misha Sanders about red bubble letters. So I think that talks about one of those foundational moments in faith development. You know, she grew up in the Pentecostal church uh, and had, at an early age, learned that God is love. That was the profound foundational message she had received about the universe. And she wanted to share this new skill of drawing red bubble letters uh, at the age of six. Um, wanted to share this on the blackboard. And inadvertently used red crayon to do so. The teacher came in and could not wipe off that red crayon from that blackboard. And six-year-old Misha thought she had done something very bad. And she was terribly embarrassed. But her Sunday school teacher, well, kind of rolled with it. The Sunday school teacher encouraged the class to say what they thought would get them in trouble with church and with God, even. And there were so many rules that they could name. You know, they didn't, they couldn't cuss, they couldn't chew gum in church, uh, they had to be obedient, all of these things. And they put them, she put them all on the blackboard and then took the eraser and wiped it clean and all that still remained was God is love. And that was the Sunday school lesson, lesson that Misha remembered. And she learned it inside, and she learned it in the embrace of the community as well. That core faith development lesson, I think, for her shaped everything. Uh, Misha is now a minister in Atlanta, Georgia, in our Unitary Versalist congregation there. I think also Misha's story is, a, is one about how the congregation is the curriculum as well. Because here was the Sunday school teacher making clear her care and love for Misha and for the entire class as well. To embrace in the way that she had, this teacher had been, so, had been so encouraged by the congregation as a part of the congregation as an adult to understand what the core message needed to be about, and then also how to communicate that and respond to the children in the moment. All of those are lessons about expressions about the congregation's ways and beings and values. Maria, Har Maria Harris talks about the congregation is the curriculum in her book, Fashion Me a People. And she was pointing out, this is in 1990, that she's pointing out the curriculum was evolving beyond simply a rote lesson and content and into the whole experience of how people come together. Uh, in her context, she was talking about how uh, that each of us is created in the image of God, and not just that, but that we are co-creators with God. And we partake of this opportunity and this blessing by creating space for teaching and blessing and remembering and prayer. That we speak of justice and compassion and the pathos, you know, tied into the pathos of God, as she would say, for human suffering and human sin. And that it as, as co-creators, it's important that we would organize ourselves, shape how we govern and how we are together. And all of this work as co-creators with, as she would say God, one could say with the universe, with all that is, with the holy, with the spirit of life, that ultimately we do so with a sense of how do we empower ourselves and our lives on this planet and the care of this planet, not just for ourselves, but for the future. So, the congregation is the curriculum. All that we say and all that we do in the practice of being 
a human community. Some of what we say will be specific and public. Some will be implicit. And there's also information in what we do and don't talk about as well. Let me return to why Unitarian Universalism is what we teach. You may or may not claim the name Unitarian Universalist, and that's fine. We understand that. I understand that. We are in the context of being a Unitarian Universalist congregation, and that has some relationships and some obligations and opportunities. Because this institution is keeping faith and covenant with other congregations and in our longer tradition, our larger hope, where we are a liberal tradition and a response to religion that has room for science and spirituality, for inspiration from tradition and culture and art and engineering, and a willingness to be shaped by all of these sources. So you might wonder, let me offer an example of when we know we succeed in faith development, in congregation as the curriculum, and Unitarian Universalism being all we teach. I have a story from my colleague Joanna Fontaine Crawford at Live Oak Unitarian Universalist Church in the Unitarian Universalist Church in uh, north of Austin, Texas. And she shares the story with permission. There was a single mom of a little girl and a little boy there. The little boy loved, loved to get his fingernails polished like his mom and his sister. But he was being bullied for it. Doesn't make any difference where that bullying was come from. He was being bullied for it from somewhere in his life. And his mom shared this on Facebook. And the next Sunday, the men of the church, the teenagers, all the way up to 70 plus, showed up with their fingernails painted. And they brought bottles of nail polish so they could paint the nails of any of men and boys who wanted it. I mean, seriously, it's kind of like, think about it like a salon at coffee hour where you have the elder, the elder gentlemen, all with glitter and sparkles and who knows what colors of the rainbow. That night, uh, the mom reported that her son asked her, so those boys at church, who were they? And the mom's response was, well, they're Unitarian Universalists. And the boy said, then I'm a Unitarian Universalist, too. Faith development is what we do in the congregation in that moment. So much was the curriculum. Because it strikes me that how precious that event was with the nail polish would have been for all kinds of people, in addition to that boy, and that mom, and the sister. You know, one of the great joys I have from growing up in Unitarian Universalism is to see how, when and how we do well at making room for people as they explore who they are and how they are in the world. I have so many good memories and important memories, not always easy, but important memories of seeing the person who is you know, figuring out their gender, figuring out their sexual orientation, um, figuring out how to be someone who is connected to a traditionally marginalized community. And that they were able to do that within a Unitarian Universalist congregation means something precious. It adds to the abundance of the world. And I'll offer a small note um, that one of the places where we know we succeed 
is also when we have a chance to struggle. That's going to be another sermon. But for right now, one of the places we are, we are really working and, and trying to understand together is in how we understand oppression, how we understand white supremacy, how we understand uh, the experience of folks from traditionally marginalized communities um, in our congregations, uh, ourselves, uh, in these, uh, from these marginalized um, identities and locations, and then how do we kind of promote and act uh, as best we can out in the world? That too is also an expression of faith development of the congregation and of our willingness in Unitarian Universalism to keep learning and to keep growing. We'll be engaging in further conversations around that as we go and as we develop in our ministry together. Um, I want to thank everybody who's been doing this work around especially social justice, uh, because this is very much our work. The great end in religious instruction is to liberate the fabulous and flawed humans that we are. The great end is to cultivate a sense of connection and resilience and meaning and leaving room for exploration, questions, frustrations, and loss for those are faith development too. And we do so in community to engage in a practice that is welcoming and embracing and beloved and sometimes aggravating because we have to get everybody's opinion in order to make some things happen sometimes. But we apply the liberal approach to religion to our own hearts, what must be examined and restored and repaired or removed, and do so again and again as whenever needed. The great end in this work of faith development is just beginning with you and me in our new ministry together. And I am so happy to be here to make this great end a great beginning. May we go forth into our further adventures of being open minds, welcoming hearts, and in the care for our lives and being good stewards of our world. May we go forth. Amen.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now, may we have faith in life to do the wise planting that the generations to come may reap even more abundantly than we. May we be bold in bringing to fruition the golden dreams of human kinship and justice. This we ask that fields of promise become fields of reality. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs> 